Turn in your Bibles there. I'm really excited that we can uh, start this book today. Uh, I think it's good to study a gospel every once in a while to remind ourselves of uh, our Lord's earthly ministry and also to listen to His words. If you have read through the New Testament, as you begin the Gospel of Matthew, you find that it is a little different than the other Gospels in that it begins with a genealogy. Now, for some, this is a hard way to get started because there's a lot of names there and there's a lot of long names and there's a lot of hard names to pronounce. And so some people can either get discouraged in reading all of those names or maybe they just skip over those names. But these names are all very important. Um, you know, we, we do recommend that when a, a person first becomes a believer and, and receives Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that you begin with the Gospel of John and, uh, and all because it is kind of easier to get into. But we're going to see the importance of why Matthew started his Gospel with this genealogy. Um, Matthew, along with Mark and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels. Each one gives a little synopsis, if you will, of the life of Jesus Christ. And when you put these uh, all together, though, they all really show a, a full and complete picture, along with the Gospel of John, of our Lord's life and ministry. Each of the Gospels target a, um, a certain audience, focusing on certain aspects of our Lord's work and ministry. Mark was written with a Roman audience in mind. They were the uh, ruling power at the time of Jesus. Mark shows Jesus Christ in his gospel as the servant of the Lord, the servant of God. Uh, a servant would understand power and authority. You will notice in Mark's gospel there is no genealogy. A servant didn't need a genealogy. The main thing about a servant was could he get the job done? And so here we, in Mark's gospel, we would see Jesus as the servant of God, given power and authority from on high, and certainly we know that he was able to get the job done. Luke was written with the Greek in mind. The Greek culture was still uh, very prevalent in the world at that day. Uh, the Greeks were the thinkers. Jesus is seen in Luke's gospel as the son of man, the perfect man whose influence would impact and change the world forever. John wrote mainly to encourage believers, but certainly with a universal appeal for all who would investigate the claims of the gospel message that Jesus Christ is God the Son, the Son of God, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. That brings us back to Matthew's gospel. Matthew was a Jew. He was not a very popular Jew. In fact, he was probably thought of as a traitor in most cases because he worked for the Roman government. The Roman government, you remember, was very oppressive. And Matthew's job in the Roman government was that as a tax collector. And so his people, the Jews, looked upon him as a, as a traitor, but not only as a traitor, but as a thief. They saw him as an extortioner, if you will, as the Roman government was oppressing the people. Here Matthew was making his living off of his own people being oppressed by the Roman government. Nevertheless, our Lord put, our, put his hand upon Matthew. He called Matthew. And Matthew responded, and that's the key. Matthew responded to the call of the Lord upon his life, and he was given the privilege then to write this account. He wrote it primarily with the Jew in mind, but as we go through, we will see that there are many, many, many reasons why uh, Gentiles or non-Jews uh, should also read this gospel. But with the Jew in mind, that's one of the reasons that we have the genealogy in the very beginning. Matthew's gospel is the connection, if you will. He is the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you were just to begin reading with one of the other gospels, it might seem strange as, well, what is, what's this all about? What's this Jesus all about? And the claims and the promises that he fulfilled. 
And Matthew ties it all together. He gives us a starting point from which to move. He presents Jesus Christ as the King of Israel, the Messiah, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Genealogy, one's genealogy was very important. In fact, it was absolutely necessary for one who would lay claim to the throne of David. To prove that one had the right to make this claim, a genealogy was absolutely necessary. So as Matthew opens his gospel, he is making it very clear that Jesus Christ has the right to make the claims that he made, that he was indeed the promised Messiah, that he is the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Over and over and over again, Matthew will go back to the Old Testament, quoting more than a hundred times references showing that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Fact is, the word fulfilled is used 16 times that Jesus fulfilled, Jesus fulfilled certain uh, uh, these, these prophecies. Before we get started, I want to give you just a few other interesting things to observe as we study Matthew's Gospel. We can really divide it, if you will, up into ten sections. And these ten sections have, there's a narrative, and then there is a teaching. Sixty percent of the Gospel of Matthew really pertains to the teaching of Jesus Christ. And so in the beginning, there's like a little narrative, and, and the first four chapters are a narrative. And then in chapters 5 through 7, there is the teaching of Jesus Christ, the Sermon on the Mount. And then there is a verse, a trans transition verse, one that would say, after Jesus had said these things, and then that would begin the next narrative. But it divides up the narrative, first of all, being chapters 1 through 4, and then the teaching of Jesus, chapters 5 and 7, and then uh, chapter 7, verse 28, being the trans transition verse. We then move into chapter 8, beginning with verse 1, and, and the, the narrative goes through chapter 9, verse 34, picking up in verse uh, 35 of chapter 9, going through 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 42, we have the next teaching of our Lord, the transition verse being 11, uh, 1, and so on. Uh, we're going to read 20 of 20 miracles in this gospel. There are six major me messages that we will listen to. The Sermon on the Mount in chapters 5 through 7. And then the charge that Jesus gave to his disciples to go into all the world in uh, chapter 10. Very interestingly, in chapter 13, we read of the parables of the kingdom. And the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, particularly the, the, the uh, the phrase, the kingdom of heaven, is used over and over and over again. Thirty-two times that phrase is used in this particular gospel. We also then have the uh, Ol Ol Olivet Discourse uh, as the next teaching. God promised that Israel would be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation unto Him. The people of Matthew's day, the Jews, were looking for the deliverer. They were looking for the king, the promised king who would establish the kingdom. The one that would come to break the bond of oppression that the Roman government held upon them. Matthew is telling them here that Jesus Christ is the promised king. Let's begin, and we're going to read just the first 17 verses and uh, you'll find it very interesting that we'll get a message out of these 17 verses here this morning. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. And Judah begot Perez and Sarah by Tamar. And uh, Perez begot Hezron and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz and Rahab by Rahab, and Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Solomon begot Rehoboam, and Rehoboam begot Abijah, and Abijah begot Asa, and Asa begot Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begot Joram, and Joram begot Uzziah. And Uzziah begot Jotham, and Jotham begot Ahaz, and Ahaz begot Hezekiah. 
And Hezekiah begot Manasseh, and Manasseh begot Ammon, and Ammon begot Josiah. Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiud, and Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, and Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot uh, Achim, and Achim begot Eliud, and Eliud begot Eleazar, Eleazar begot uh, Methan, and Methan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. And so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. From the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. There, if you haven't read that genealogy, you've read it now. <laughs> Father, we ask that you would minister to us, Lord, as we open your word this morning. And Lord, even in this genealogy, Lord, that we, God, would, uh, Lord, have our hearts touched by you and by your goodness. Speak to us, Lord. May our hearts be prepared. Lord, touch us. Teach us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. You know, it's exciting to... Uh, just read this and just see this record and be able to follow through uh, to see uh, the genealogy of our Lord. He begins by saying, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's interesting that this phrase, the book of the genealogy of, is only found in one other place in the Scripture. You can go back through all the other genealogy records and everything, but you only find this phrase, the book of the genealogy of, in one other place. That place is Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, where we read that this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. We are all in the family of Adam. We are in the family of Adam through birth, through natural birth. Consequently, all, everyone, is in Adam. But the Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 22, that in Adam, all die. Read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and then go back and begin with Genesis chapter 5, verse 1, and read the genealogy. And it tells us that after each one, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. Somehow that's not real encouraging to me. Uh, how many times have you maybe thought over in your, your mind about this life? If this was all there was to life, you know, there must be more. There just be, must be more to life. What if, you know, this was it? You know, you're here, you're born, you die, and bingo, gone. Nothing else, no more. I believe that no matter how, quote-unquote, a good person or one might be or might think they have been, if this life was all that there was and all that there is, that they would still find that emptiness inside, that something was missing. As we'd lay upon our deathbed, come to the end of the road, the end of the line, if you will, and we're to cross that line into eternity, and if this life was all that there was, it would just seem so empty, something missing. But there is indeed more. In Adam, all die. And that's really true for everyone also. Some die and will be lost forever and ever. Others die to be born again. And therefore, we have another genealogy, the one that Matthew brings before us here. The genealogy of the book, or the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. One gets into that family by birth also. They get into that family by new birth. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 3, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And in verse 7 he says, Do not marvel that I said to you, 
you must be born again. So here we have the genealogy then of the one in whom life is and who life is all about, Jesus Christ, the giver of life. For in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, where we read in Adam, all die, we also read in Christ, all are made alive. In other words, those who come to Christ in faith and receive Him as Lord and Savior, confess their sin, repent of their sin, in Christ they will be made alive. And I can say hallelujah and amen to that. Amen? amen. All right, I like the Pentecostal feel every once in a while. You know, just just to make sure that everybody's, you know, with me and all. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This was all important if Jesus Christ indeed was the promised Messiah, the Redeemer, the Deliverer, the promised King who would sit upon the throne of David. His genealogy must be able to be proved. It must be able to be followed back. He must be able to have a genealogy that would follow back through David to Abraham because God made specific promises to both of these men concerning the Messiah. Could it be proven? That's what Matthew has done for us right here. Let's look at the promise that God made to Abraham. If you'll turn to Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. Way back in the beginning. We should probably get used to doing a lot of flip-flopping here because we're going to start doing this. We're going to start looking. Let's see hands. Who's at Genesis? Who doesn't know where Genesis is? No. <laughs> Just go to the very first book and you'll find it there. The book of beginnings. In chapter 12 of the book of Genesis, in verse 3, the Lord speaks to Abraham as he's calling him. He's calling him to, to leave the land where he was born. He's calling him to leave his family. He's calling him to trust him. Can you imagine being Abraham saying, leave your home, leave your family. And follow me. Well, that's what he said to us. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Follow me. And so that's really what the Lord is saying to Abraham here. And as Abraham was obedient to follow the call of the Lord, the Lord spoke in verse 3 and said, I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in all of the families of the earth, in you, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. So there's the first promise. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, through you, through your seed, this is what Abraham understood the Lord to be telling him, all of the families of the earth, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Turn over to Genesis chapter 22. In verse 17. Again, after being obedient, this is the chapter that talks about when the Lord had told Abraham to take his son, his only son, and go up to Moriah, Mount Moriah. He would offer him as a sacrifice. And in obedience, we found out and we know that the Lord didn't want Isaac. He wanted Abraham. He wanted Abraham fully and completely. He wanted all of him. He wanted obedience in his life. I think that Abraham might have gotten consumed a little bit with his son, the promised son that he had waited so long for. You remember he tried to, to find in Ishmael the promise of the Lord, and the Lord said, no, it's not in Ishmael. But you will have a son, a son that I will give to Sarah and you. And it was in Isaac. And then when the Lord, you know, told him to go on the mount and to, to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, can you imagine? I mean, just put yourself in that place. But because of the promise that the Lord had made to Abraham back in chapter 12, that through him and through his seed, that all of the nations 
of the earth would be blessed. Abraham held on to that promise. Somehow or another, the Lord's going to work this out. He's going to work it out. But in obedience, the Lord speaks. And in verse 17, he says, In blessing, I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven. This is after the Lord had showed him, I don't, It's not your son, it's you that I want. I want you, Abraham. But I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And what Abraham understood in this promise is that he would indeed raise up the Messiah through him who would be a blessing to all of the nations of the earth. When we hear of the Jewish nation being the chosen people, they were the people who were chosen through whom the Messiah would come. This is really what that means. They were chosen by God that through them the Messiah would come. But to claim to be the Messiah, one must not only prove that he was a descendant of Abraham, but also that he was a descendant, a son of David. As a son of Abraham, that would put Jesus in the nation. As a son of David, it would put him on the throne. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 7. That might be a little more difficult to find. Just keep going left and you'll come there. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, chapter 7. In verse 12, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, the Lord speaking to David, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, of course, the immediate thought would be through Solomon, but certainly he did not reign forever. But the reference here, again, is to our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn over to Psalm 89. In Psalm 89... The psalmist writes, and this is not David, this is not a psalm of David, it's a contemplation of Ethan, the Ezraite. He reads of that promise that the Lord had made to David. I have made, verse 3, a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Here it gets very specific. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. What did we read this morning in Psalm 132? Turn over to Psalm 132. In verse 11 of Psalm 132, The Lord has sworn in truth to David, so the promise made to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of of your body. Now David understood this promise to be that the Messiah would indeed come through his seed. That he would be a descendant of his, that he would come through his line and his genealogy, a king to set up on his throne forever and ever. The prophet Jeremiah speaks of this in Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, and repeat it again in chapter 33, verse 14. Behold, you can turn there if you like, Jeremiah 23, 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. Verse 6 of Jeremiah 23. 
In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called. Jehovah, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah to Sidkenu. And so obviously this did not apply to Solomon. It applied to David's greater son, Jesus Christ. In Isaiah, turn back to Isaiah, just a book back. Chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. A very familiar scripture. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord will perform it. And we know that that is applicable only to Jesus Christ. He's the one, and the only one, that meets the requirements of the promised king of Israel by being a descendant of both Abraham and David. You find it very interesting today that no genealogy exists that can trace the ancestry of any Jew now living back. So, the Jews are still looking for a Messiah. They are still looking for their Messiah to come. In order for one to make the claim that he is the Messiah, he must be able to prove his genealogy. The records were all destroyed. It seems that the records were kept in the temple by the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin were the, were the religious leaders uh, in the, in, uh, of, of the day. And it would seem um, that, the, that the records were kept in the temple. You remember back in Ezra when uh, this one fellow came to Ezra and, and he wanted to uh, uh, be one of the, or fulfill the priestly duty. Well, he had to be of the, of the line of Levi and he, couldn't, he could not prove his genealogy and so was disqualified. In A.D. 70, the temple was destroyed in Jerusalem and with it all of the records by which one could prove their genealogy back through David through Abraham. And so there is no genealogy today that, that exists by which one can trace their ancestry uh, back uh, to prove, to make this claim. But no problem. The Messiah has come. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so Matthew continues now giving record. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers, and Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram, and Ram begot Aminadab, and Aminadab begot Neshon, and Neshon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. And David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. As you can see, we're going to read this genealogy. You may not have ever read this genealogy. You, you may have been those that have skipped over. But by the time we get done here today, you will have read it at least twice. As we look at this, these verses here, verses 2 through 6, as you look closely, you can't help but see something most interesting in the genealogy. We have the names of or reference to four women. Rarely were women ever listed in the genealogies since the names and inheritances came through the fathers. But nevertheless, here we find three named with reference to another, and then, of course, in verse 16, Mary, the mother of Jesus, making five women all together that are listed in the genealogy here of our Lord uh, in Matthew's Gospel. The four mentioned have some, something in common, and uh, they have a common thread, backgrounds that are similar, 
but interestingly enough, less than desirable. Uh, I'm going to just reflect upon these four women because it is so unique that they are listed in the genealogy record that we have. Do you remember the story of Tamar? Yes? No? Was it David Carroll that said last week, if I see all the heads go like this, I know you got it. And so, well, Her story is found in Genesis chapter um, 38. She was married to one of Judah's sons. And this son did wicked in the eyes of the Lord and was killed before they could have any children. Now the custom of that day then was if the one who had died had a brother, then this brother would then marry the widow so that she could conceive and have children so that the line could follow. And that's exactly uh, what happened to a point. Um, the brother did, in fact, um, get together with Tamar, but he did that which, was, which displeased the Lord, and the Lord also killed him before a child was conceived. Two down. Son. But he wasn't really anxious to... Uh, to let this son really uh, marry Tamar. So he said, listen, Tamar, put on your widow's clothing and you come and you live with us. And we'll take care of you until my other son is, is old enough. And as time went on, Tamar realized that David had no intention of allowing his other son to marry Tamar probably gave some thought to odds aren't really good here. <laughs> but um, as time went on, uh, Judah's wife died. And uh, when it was told to Tamar that his wife had died and she realized that Judah was not going to allow his other son to uh, marry Tamar, uh, Judah had gone to Timnah to uh, to the sheep shearers there uh, to really be comforted because of the loss of his wife. And Tamar dressed up, as, if you will, as a, as a harlot, as a prostitute. And uh, she was determined that she was going to conceive either through one of you know, Judah's sons or through Judah himself. And so uh, she went to Timnah and uh, dressed up as a harlot. And sure enough, uh, uh, she disguised herself, and Judah came by, and he propositioned her. And um, she said, okay, no problem, but what do you give me? He said, oh. he said I'll give you a goat. <laughs> and she said, okay, but you don't have a goat with you. What are you going to you know, give me to make sure I get the goat? Because she was going to get his goat. <laughs> In more than one way, probably. I mean, we know. But uh, So he gave her his ring and um, gave her some other things. And uh, sure enough, uh, she conceived. And as time went by, uh, well, you know, Judah had sent back some of his servants to uh, find the woman to give her the goat and to get back his things. But when, when he asked in town, you know, hey, where's the harlot that was here? Uh, or when, you know, his servants did, well, there's no harlot here. There has never been a harlot here. And, so he went back and told Judah, say, well, let her, let her go, let her have it, no problem. You know, she, no, no problem. But then he found out that his daughter-in-law had indeed become pregnant and had, in a sense, played the harlot. And Judah's first response was, burn her, kill her. You know, she's, she's insulted us, and he was furious. And uh, the rest of the story, obviously... Uh, comes down that, um, you know, she says, okay, but the one to whom these belong, the ring, and it was a belt, I believe, and a staff, this is the one by whom I am pregnant. And Judah said, she has been more honorable than me. 
And uh, here we find Tamar now as uh, in the line and the genealogy uh, of our Lord, uh, in the messi messianic line. And she, uh, uh, she was the mother of Perez. Um, and so very interesting. Uh, Tamar, uh, a, a Gentile and uh, one who was less than honorable, should we say, um, but nevertheless, uh, Judah found her uh, to be honorable and the Lord found her honorable to put her in the, the genealogy. We may be more familiar with Rahab. Her story is found in Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse 6. And uh, she too was a Gentile and she was a prostitute. But unlike Tamar, this was how she made her pro uh, profession. This was her profession. Uh, you remember that when Joshua was uh, preparing to go into uh, uh, into the promised land and to invade Jericho. He sent in spies, and the spies, interestingly enough, you know, they went and stayed with Rahab. And um, as they figured out, you know, when, when the people of the town heard what had happened and all, they, they came to, uh, to find the, the, the two spies to, to really kill them. And you remember Rahab hid them. And then as you read in chapter 2 there, there was, a, there was a big discussion that went on, you know, how Rahab had, had, had told them, you know, since I have, uh, you know, shown kindness to you, will you show kindness to me when you come in and invade Jericho because we've heard what your Lord has done. And there's really some things in what she said that really lead you to believe uh, that obviously she received uh, with her understanding the Lord uh, as, as her God, the God of, of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And sure enough, uh, you know, they said to her, um, well, when, when we come back, if you'll hang this scarlet ro uh, uh, rope out of your window, you and your whole household will indeed be saved. And sure enough, when they came uh, and began marching around the Sahab and all of her family out before the walls came tumbling down because her house was on the wall, here she also is uh, found in the genealogy of our Lord. And um, she married a man named Salmon. Somehow I think of fishing when I read that. I don't know why, but... Uh, uh, she married a man named Salmon, uh, who was the father of Boaz, uh, the great-grandfather of David. Uh, Ruth would be the next one who is mentioned. Now, um, she doesn't have quite the same kind of background that... Uh, Tamar and Rahab had. She was really uh, an honorable woman, but she was also a Gentile. She was a Moabite. And you remember the Lord had put a curse upon the Moabites because of the evilness that they had done to the children of Israel uh, as they were wandering through uh, the wilderness. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 3. None of the descendants of Moab shall enter the congregation of the Lord forever. Forever, he says. And yet, nevertheless, we see Ruth mentioned here a Moabite woman. Um, she married Boaz, and they had a son, Obed. And Obed was the father of Jesse, the grandmother of David. Um, now, the next woman we read in the genealogy here is really not mentioned by name, but we know that she is Bathsheba, the one who was the wife of Uriah. It's interesting, we're all very familiar with this story, how tragic it is, but isn't it interesting also how God can turn just the worst of situations around. He can turn the worst of situations around and be glorified through them. But we're familiar how David committed adultery with uh, Bathsheba, had uh, her husband uh, Uriah killed to really protect himself after he uh, had gotten Bathsheba pregnant. Uh, interestingly, uh, their son did die. And you remember the whole situation, though, with Nathan the prophet who came and, and really uh, David was convicted and, uh, and repented. Uh, he ended up marrying uh, Bathsheba and they had another son uh, whose name was Solomon and the Messianic line uh, was continued. What can we gather from this? these Gentile women who really had no part in the, uh, in the whole program uh, with the chosen people of Israel, um, uh, prostitutes, people with a horrible, horrible past. You know, if we get nothing else, 
I would hope that maybe from, from just reading these names listed here, that we can somehow embrace and come close to the grace of our Lord. Because I believe that that is what he is showing here by listing these and including these in the genealogy uh, of, our, of our Lord. Uh, we read of the testimony of these that would seem uh, in many cases to be so un unworthy. We might even consider our own unworthiness. Or we might even, though we shouldn't, you know, maybe look at the unworthiness of, of, of someone else. But nevertheless, how thankful we are that the door has been opened and God's grace remains open today to all who will come to Him through faith in Jesus Christ and receive forgiveness of their sin and then there is a place for them in His kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. In God's plan, no one will be excluded if they will come in faith. A faith that says, Not my will, but thine be done. A faith that responds even as Matthew's faith, faith responded when the Lord put His hand upon Matthew responded and said, yes, I believe, I trust in you, forgive me of my sin. And he was obedient to the call, Lord, I want to live my life to please you. So often it gets so turned around, it's living our life to please ourselves. But we remember what John the Baptist said, he must increase, I must decrease. And that's the significance and the importance of believing, letting the Lord increase in our lives, fill our lives to overflowing with His goodness and with His grace. Lord, I want to live my life to please You. Forgive me of my sin. I believe with a faith that takes action, doesn't just give lip service. Oh, we can all come to church on a Sunday morning and we can give lip service. And aren't we good Christians? We came, we did our duty for the week, and we, we came to church and, and all, and then go away during the week. And man, some of the things that we allow to consume our minds and our thoughts and the way that we treat one another and the things that we think about each other and the things that we say and the things that we do to our co-workers, to our husbands, to our wives, to our children, to our parents. And it gets ugly. But a faith that takes action is just not lip service. Of course I'm a Christian. Born in America. And then go off and live my life the rest of the week without any testimony. To those, it'll be a rude awakening one day. I really believe that. You remember Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord and you do not the things that I ask? Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Something to think about. Why did Paul just tell us in the last uh, epistle that we read, examine yourselves to see if you'd be of the faith? So there's, you know, there, there's going to be evidence. When we make the proclamation that we are believers, there's going to be a life that gives testimony and a lifestyle that bears witness. to those who come in faith and who respond to that call. Then, through it all, no matter what the failure, the immoral past that many of us have come from, no matter how ugly, if one will come and receive His grace, then they will receive His free gift and forgiveness. You know, I see that in these women. You know, they had an ugly past. I have an ugly past. And I can't imagine why God's grace would be extended to me. But I'm so thankful that it is through Jesus Christ and through faith in Him that I'm forgiven. I could find many ways to exclude me from the kingdom of God. I could find many ways in my life that would exclude me from the kingdom of heaven. But through the prophet Isaiah, the Lord spoke, my ways are not your ways, and I'm so thankful for that. My thoughts are not your thoughts. For as heaven is high above the earth, 
so am I, so much higher than your ways and your thoughts. Hear these women, sinners with a past, but forgiven by his grace, saved by his grace. Do you know we're not saved by God's love? Our God is a God of love, but it's not by his love that we're saved. Paul tells us very clearly in Ephesians chapter 2 that we're saved by His grace. And that's love, really, that cost our God so that you and I could be saved. That's His grace. That's His grace extended to us. (sighs) Lord, let my life be pleasing to you. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for God's grace extended. Extended to me. Extended to you who believe. And if you don't believe today, I encourage you. The Lord is reaching out to you today with His grace, which is His unmerited favor towards you. And then we can be used, even even as these women were used, They were used by the Lord in, even through horrible circumstances. But whatever our past is, when we come to God and receive the forgiveness of His grace through faith, He can use us. He will use us to His glory, even as these women. Let's go on. Solomon begot Rehoboam. Rehoboam begot Abijah, verse 7. And Abijah begot Asa. And Asa begot Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat begot Joram. And Joram begot Uzziah. Uzziah begot Jotham. And Jotham begot Ahaz. And Ahaz begot Hezekiah. Hezekiah begot Manasseh. Manasseh begot Ammon. And Ammon begot Josiah. And Josiah begot Jeconiah. And his brothers, about the time they were carried away, to Babylon. Now, as we move through the genealogy record here, there's something that we need to point out to just show also how awesome our God is. He is a God of grace and a God of mercy, but He is also sovereign and will let nothing stand in His way for His plan to be carried out. Our God is sovereign. He is in control. He is the one calling the shots. No matter how bleak the picture may look, He's in control. And here is a perfect example. It'll get clear as soon as we reach verse 16 that Jesus is not the son of Joseph. But as the scripture says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Joseph was our Lord's stepfather. Joseph is in the line of David, though, through Solomon. And as his stepson, being the, the, Mary, the, the husband of Mary, he gave Jesus the legal right or title, if you will, to the throne of David. Joseph is of the royal line. He came through the line of David. You say, fine, what's the problem? What's the big deal? Well, in verse 11 is where it becomes a big deal. Verse 11 says that Josiah begot Jeconiah and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. Now, a student of the Old Testament will tell you, and if this was the only genealogical record that we have, we'd be in problems, we'd be in big problems, you know, justifying here the Lord uh, and his right to the throne. Uh, if, if it was all through the line of Solomon. Because Jesus couldn't be the heir because of a curse that was put upon Jeconiah through the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 22, verse 30, repeated in chapter 36, verse 30, where the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, write this man down as childless. Now this man is also referred to in the scripture as uh, Jehoiakim. And, uh, uh, and Coniah, uh, dropping the J-E, which would make reference to Jehovah. Uh, but he is also referenced there in Chronicles and, and Kings as uh, uh, Jehoiakim. 
But he says, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not prosper in his days, for none of his descendants shall prosper sitting on the throne of David and ruling anymore in Judah. And so with him, the royal line stopped. However, Jesus Christ is not of the seed of Joseph, nor is he of the seed of Jeconiah, but of Mary. Both Joseph and Mary had to come from the line of David for the prophecy to be fulfilled, but they are through two different lines. If you read the genealogy in Luke's Gospel, it all of a sudden becomes very clear as we trace the line of Christ clear back to Adam. You'll notice that Mary was a descendant of David, but through another son, Nathan. And so the royal line continues, and we don't have a problem. Our God is so awesome. So awesome. Oh, how people would just love to grab on to the fact, you know, if they just read here, this genealogy. But there is another genealogy in Luke's gospel. But they read here. See, he couldn't be the Messiah. Because anyone that followed through Solomon to Jeconiah, it all stopped right there. But through David's other son, Nathan, continued on. And that's where Mary's line follows. Mary's line follows through Nathan. And so God took care of the situation. He is an awesome God, isn't he? Isn't he? I mean, when you start just putting some of the things together, you know, wherever there's a problem that we have in Scripture, there's not really a problem with the Scripture. The problem is my own mind. Remember, we're talking here about the infinite God, and if my finite mind can't reconcile, can't figure out, can't put it all together, the problem is in my own mind. Because God has worked his perfect plan out. And it is that, a perfect plan. So, no man will stand in the way of God's plan. His plan will prevail. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconiah begot Shealtiel, and Shealtiel begot Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begot Abiud, and Abiud begot Eliakim, and Eliakim begot Azor, and Azor begot Zadok, and Zadok begot uh, Achim, and Achim begot Eliud, and Eliud begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Mathan, and Mathan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. And so the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon, 14, and from the captivity in Babylon until Christ are 14 generations. Matthew, it seems, divides these up. You remember they didn't have, you know, really a lot of, um, they, they couldn't have a lot of records. So that every, you know, everybody just couldn't take their little genealogy records home. That's why they were kept in the temple. I mean, it was very expensive to, to write these things down and write these things out. And so one of the ways, um, you know, we, we hear of acrostic psalms. And acrostic psalms were those psalms or uh, where, where a letter... Uh, the Hebrew alphabet was used to memorize those psalms and it seems like that Matthew uh, because there are names that are missing as you go back and you read through Chronicles and Kings there are names that are missing in the genealogy but it's complete with the names that he gave and he divided them up into, into two or three sets of 14 so that I believe with my finite mind that it would be easy you know, for those uh, to really memorize and to be able to uh, see the completeness uh, of the record. Um, but Matthew, in, in these 17 verses, uh, has bridged that gap, making it very clear to the Jewish readers in particular that yes, his genealogy does follow through David back to Abraham. Yes, he is the Messiah, the promised king, the lion of the true tribe of Judah. God's promised Messiah. And next week, we're going to read about ah, the virgin birth. 